Hey again. Uh, moved over to the comfy chair. I'm sitting here in my red hoodie and my different shade of red pajamas. Um, I look great, don't I? As you can see, I've got the weight of glory. If you remember, chapter 3 was like the longest chapter. I assume we're going to have to break it up into at least three parts. So I figured we'd get a few more pages into it. So what he'd been talking about last time was how we have, uh, what did he call it, moral certainty. Applying that to, is it uh, immoral to obey uh, civil society or basically in reference to going to war? How do we know if it's, if it's morally justified? And uh, this next section, uh, he was going to discuss the, the facts. Because he said, I now apply these tests to the judgment. Is it immoral to obey when the civil society of which I am a member commands me to serve in the wars? So that's where we're picking up. First, as to the facts, the main relevant fact admitted by all parties is that war is very disagreeable. The main contention urged as fact by pacifists would be that wars always do more harm than good. How is one to find out whether this is true? It belongs to a class of historical generalizations which involve a comparison between the actual consequence of some actual event and a consequence which might have followed it, followed if that event had not occurred. Wars do no good involves the proposition that if the Greeks had yielded to Xerxes and the Romans to Hannibal, the course of history ever since would have been perhaps better, but certainly no worse than it actually has been. That a Mediterranean world in which Carth Carthaginian power succeeded Persian would have been at least as good and happy and as fruitful for all posterity as the actual Mediterranean world in which Roman power succeeded Greek. My point is not that such an opinion seems to me overwhelmingly improbable. My point is that both opinions are merely speculative. There is no conceivable way of convincing a man of either. Indeed, it is doubtful whether the whole conception of what would have happened, that is, of unrealized possibilities, is more than an, more than an imaginative technique for giving a viv wow. <laughs> for giving a vivid rhetorical account of what did happen. That wars do no good is then so far from being a fact that it hardly ranks as a historical opinion, nor is the matter mended by saying modern wars. How are we to decide whether the total effect would have been better or worse if Europe had submitted to Germany in 1914? It is, of course, true that wars never do half the good which the, le which the leaders of the belligerents say they are going to do. Nothing ever does half the good, perhaps nothing ever does half the evil, which is expected of it. And that may be a sound argument for not pitching one's propaganda too high. But it is no argument against war. If a Germanized Europe in 1914 would have been an evil, then the war which prevented that evil was, so far, justified. To call it useless because it did not also cure slums and unemployment is like coming up to a man who has just succeeded in defending himself from a man-eating tiger and saying, It's no good, old chap. This hasn't really cured your rheumatism. <laughs> On the test of fact, then, I find that pacifist position weak. It seems to me that history is full of useful wars as well as of useless wars. If all, that, if all that can be brought against the frequent appearance of utility is mere speculation about what would have happened, I am not converted. I turn next to the intuition. There is no question of discussion once we have found it. There is only the danger of mistaking it for an intuition something which is, for an intuition something which is really a conclusion and therefore needs argument. I finally figure out what this sentence is saying. If my emphasis made that weird, I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread it. There is only the danger of mistaking for an intuition something which is really a conclusion and therefore needs argument. We want something which no good man has ever disputed. We are in search of platitude. The relevant intuition seems to be that love is good and hatred bad, or that helping is good and harming bad. We have next to consider whether reasoning leads us from this intuition to the pacifist conclusion or not. And the first thing I notice is that intuition can lead to no action until it is limited in some way or another. You cannot do simply good 
to simply man. You must do this or that good to this or that man. And if you do this good, you can't at the same time do that. And if you do it to these men, you can't also do it to those. Hence, from the outset, the law of benef beneficence involves not doing some good to some men at some times. Hence, those rules which so far as I know have never been doubted, as that we should help one we have promised to help rather than another, or a benefactor rather than one who has no special claims on us, or a compatriot more than a stranger, or a kinsman rather than a mere compatriot. And this, in fact, most often means helping A at the expense of B, who drowns while you pull A on board. And sooner or later, it involves helping A by actually doing some degree of violence to B. And when B is up to mischief again, against A, wow. But when B is up to mischief against A, you must either do nothing, which disobeys the intuition, or you must help one against the other. And certainly no one's conscience tells him to help B, the guilty. It remains, therefore, to help A. So far, I suppose, we all agree. If the argument is not to end in an anti-pacifist conclusion, one or other of two stopping places must be selected. You must either say that violence to B is lawful only if it stops short of killing, or else that killing of individuals is indeed lawful, but the mass killing of war is not. He said, so far, I suppose we all agree. I feel like he made a little bit of a, a connector that I didn't follow and then ran with it like it was absolute truth. Because I followed the part about you can only do so much to so many people at a time. Like, that's true. If, if you're helping someone, you can't help another person at the same time. So you help A over B. And then you have to determine who A is going to be versus B. So you help the person you've promised to help. You help the person closest to you rather than a stranger. Um, so yeah, this fact most often means helping A at the expense of B, who drowns while you pull A on board. But this next part, it says, and sooner or later, it involves helping A by actually doing some degree of violence to B. Why is that necessarily true? I know it can be true, but not necessarily true. Unless B is necessarily going to stir up trouble against A. Like you can defend A, but that doesn't necessarily m mean that you're going to have to be antagonistic toward B without it being for defense, right? Yeah, I'm not sure I follow that that um, that logic. I'm, uh, not follow, I follow it. I don't agree with it. I don't agree that that is necessarily true. And the rest of this paragraph was built on the assumption that it's, that, that statement is true. I'll be curious what you think about that. If I'm missing something or you, or you disagree, I'm, I'm open to being wrong. But just me reading this by myself, I, I don't... I don't think he's right. Okay, anyway. Um, so, he says, You must either say that violence to be is lawful only if it stops short of killing or else that killing of individuals is indeed lawful, but the mass killing of a war is not. As regards the first, I admit the general prop proposition that the lesser violence done to be is always preferable to the greater, provided that it is equally efficient in restraining him and equally good for everyone concerned, including B, whose claim is inferior to all the other claims involved, but not non-existent. But I do not therefore conclude that to kill B is always wrong. In some instances, for instance in a small, isolated community, death may be the only efficient method of restraint. In any community, its effect on the population, not simply as a deterrent through fear, but also as an expression of the moral importance of certain crimes, may be valuable. And as for B himself, I think a bad man is at 
least as likely to make a good end in the execution shed some weeks after the crime as in the prison hospital 20 years later. I am not producing arguments to show that capital punishment is certainly right. I am only maintaining that it is not certainly wrong. It is a matter on which good men may legitimately differ. So in that paragraph, I feel like he's working on the assumption that B will be antagonistic toward A. And if that's true, then going back to that first statement of you'll have to help A commit violence against B, that is the only way that would be true, I feel like. But he didn't, unless I missed it, he didn't specify that up front. And I guess in the context of World War II, you feel like you're A in Germany and the Allies are A and the Axis powers are B. And I guess you feel like they keep coming because this is the second time in, what, 30 years that they've they've had a world war. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so maybe that perspective just feels necessarily true in that time period. But we'll move on. As regards the second, the position seems to be much clearer. It is arguable that a criminal can always be satisfactorily dealt with without the death penalty. It is certain that a whole nation cannot be prevented from taking what it wants except by war. It is almost equally certain that the absorption of certain societies by certain other societies is a great evil. That's interesting. That's what Rome did. Rome would go to war with a neighboring people. And uh, obviously for a long time they were victorious. And they would just absorb those people and say, you're Roman now. Like That is how they grew and, and kept their strength. Is, instead of saying, you're subjugated to us or, or you know you have to pay us because we rule over you, they just annexed them and said, you're part of Rome now. Our success is your success. And a lot of people got on board with that. I know that's not what he's talking about. You may not even care. I've read a few books about Roman history in the past five, six years. I need to finish them, but um, that popped in my head. I, I, I don't necessarily think we need to follow Rome's example, but I think Rome is fascinating, and I think there's a lot to learn there. Anywho, <clears throat> where was that? Uh, it is almost equally certain that the absorption of certain societies by certain other societies is a great evil. The doctrine that war is always a greater evil seems to imply a materialist ethic. A belief that death and pain are the greatest evils, but I do not think they are. I think the suppression of a higher religion by a lower, or even a higher secular culture by a lower, a much greater evil. Nor am I greatly moved by the fact that many of the individuals we strike down in war are innocent. And that seems, in a way, to make war not worse but better. All men die, and most men miserably. That two soldiers on opposite sides each believing his own country to be in the right, each at the moment when his selfishness is most in abeyance and his will to sacrifice in the ascendant, should kill each other in plain battle, seems to me by no means one of the most terrible things in this very terrible war, terrible world. <clears throat> of course, one of them, at least, must be mistaken. And of course, war is a very great evil. But that is not the question. The question is whether war is the greatest evil in the world, so that any state of affairs which might result from submission is certainly preferable. And I do not see any really cogent arguments for that view. Another attempt to get a pacifist conclusion from intuition is of a more political and calculating kind. If not the greatest evil, yet war is a great evil. Therefore, we should all like to remove it if we can. But every war leads to another war. The removal of war must therefore be attempted. We must increase by propaganda the number of pacifists in each nation until it becomes great enough to deter that nation from going to war. This seems to me wild work. Only liberal societies tolerate pacifists. In the liberal society, the number of pacifists will either be large enough to cripple the state as a belligerent or not. If not, you have done nothing. If it is large enough, then you have handed over the state which does, which does tolerate pacifist to its totalitarian neighbor who does not. Pacifism of this kind is taking the straight road to a world in which there will be no pacifist. <clears throat> it may be asked whether, faint as the hope is of ab 
of abolishing war by pacifism, and there is any other hope. But the question belongs to a mode of thought which I find quite alien to me. It consists in assuming that the great permanent miseries in human life must be curable if only we can find the right cure. And it then proceeds by elimination and concludes that whatever is left, however unlikely to prove a cure, must nevertheless do so. Hence the fanaticism of Marxists, Freudians, Eugenists, Spiritualists, Douglasites, Federal Unionists, Vegetarians, and all the rest. <laughs> oh, I love that Vegetarians was included in that. Uh, I guess uh, C.S. Lewis was definitely a meat eater. But I have received no assurance that anything we can do will eradicate suffering. I think the best results are obtained by people who work quietly away at limited objectives, such as the abolition of the slave trade, or prison reform, or factory acts, or tuberculosis, not by those who think they can achieve universal justice, or health, or peace. I think the art of life consists in tackling each immediate evil as well as we can. To avert or postpone one particular war by wise policy, or to render one particular campaign shorter by strength and skill, or less terrible by mercy to the conquered and the civilians is more useful than all the proposals for universal peace that have ever been made. Just as the dentist who can stop one toothache has deserved better of humanity than all the men who think they have some scheme for producing a perfectly healthy race. That was uh, definitely a shot at the Germans that I wasn't expecting. Okay, Not that he was wrong, I just we seem to be very general and then a very specific shot at the Germans. I do not, therefore, find any very clear and cogent reason for inferring from the general principle of beneficence the conclusion that I must disobey if I am called on by lawful authority to be a soldier. I turn next to consider authority, capital authority, so God. Authority is either special or general, and again, either human or divine. Oh, I guess it's not God, it's just capital authority, so I guess the, the great authority more than just government. Uh, how much we got left? Oh, several pages. Several pages. Okay. Let's see. I'm wondering, that might be a good place to stop. Yeah. Um... <coughs> Yeah, this next section we're going to be talking about authority. So what, what authority is and, and how much we need to obey it and, and where it gets its... Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll stop there. Anyway, um, we may get this in one more video. Yeah, let's see. One, two, three, four, five... Yeah, okay. Let me be it for now. Um, not that I agreed with necessarily everything he said, but I did find that section more interesting. Um, and I, I hope we have more of that where it, you know, is at least worth thinking about and, and interesting to hear. I'll talk to you later. Bye.